We're uh, in a series of uh, short books of the Bible toward the back of the uh, New Testament. And so after finishing uh, the uh, book of Titus uh, last week, we've, uh, we're now coming to the next uh, book, uh, Philemon. I said to a friend, I'm uh, sharing from Philemon, and he said, where's that? I've never heard of it. And, uh, and probably even more important is, um, how do you pronounce it? Is it uh, Phil, Phil the Man or, um, or is it Philemon? And I guess that can um, take up the first half of your discipleship group discussions, working out what to say. But I'm going to call it uh, Philemon. And uh, before we read it, it is one of uh, Paul's, uh, it's, it's his uh, shortest letter. Um, but before we read it, I think it's really helpful to picture the background to the letter because it is a very uh, personal uh, letter that uh, Paul writes to his friend uh, Philemon. And uh, his, his uh, Philemon became a friend of Paul because uh, Paul, it would seem from the letter, had helped Philemon come to Jesus and uh, come to be a follower of Jesus. And uh, Paul himself... Um, had been transformed by Jesus. He had met Jesus on the road to Damascus. In some ways, he was, uh, I imagine, he was a pretty unfriendly, religious, but pretty unfriendly sort of person going off to Damascus to uh, uh, persecute more Christians. But he came to meet Jesus and his life was transformed. And uh, so for two years, uh, it would seem during his third missionary journey, he was uh, in a place called Ephesus, and there were many people who came to believe in Jesus there in Ephesus and uh, both uh, visit, uh, people who lived there and also visitors. And it seems like Philemon, who was uh, reasonably wealthy, he owned slaves and had a house big enough to eventually have his church in, the, in his own home. Um, as Paul shared the gospel, he came to give his life to Jesus because uh, in the letter which we'll read, Paul writing to Philemon said, you owe me even your own very self. It's a beautiful thing when we can help others come to see the very fulfilment of their lives to know Jesus. And um, if it was up to Paul in one sense, uh, he wouldn't have had anything to do with, uh, with Greek people. This is not an anti-Greek session. What he meant was people who were non-Jews. And uh, there was a real barrier that we don't perhaps realise these days uh, between Jew and Gentile. And the Gentiles, the, the non-Jewish people were regarded as pretty unclean and uh, irreligious. And yet uh, God brought both Paul and Philemon to know Jesus and brought them together as very close friends. And, uh, and then Philemon uh, had a slave called uh, Onesimus. Onesimus, uh, it means useful in, uh, in Greek, but, um, but as far as Philemon was concerned, he was pretty useless because he had run away. And when you run away, uh, a good place to hide is in a big city. And so it would seem as though Onesimus ran away to Rome and uh, it happened at the same time that Paul was there uh, in Rome as a, as a prisoner. And uh, he meets Paul in prison. Somehow, we don't know how that God worked that out, but he meets Paul in prison and Paul helps Onesimus come to know Jesus. And as we read the letter this morning, Paul and Onesimus had to put, put it right. It wasn't good that Onesimus just ran away. He may have stolen things as he ran, but things had to be put right. And so Paul writes a letter and gives it to Onesimus, the runaway slave, and says, I, I want you to take this back to Philemon. And uh, I want you to uh, imagine um, Philemon looking out the window of his house and he sees his runaway slave, Onesimus, coming up the driveway. And, uh, and uh, he goes out to meet him and he doesn't know what's going on. 
and, uh, and, and, and before Philemon could say anything, Onesimus says, I've got a letter from Paul. And, uh, and Philemon says, Paul, Paul, uh, have you met? Where is he? Oh, he's in prison, but, but you've got to read the letter. Yeah, but what are you doing here? You ran away. Yeah, but you've got to read the letter. You've got to read the letter first. We, we just love to jump in on things instead of allowing people to say, <clears throat> but where have you been? Just read the letter. Just read the letter. So Philemon takes the scroll uh, I know we don't even have letters with stamps on these days, but back then it was most likely to be a scroll, that uh, parchment or something. And, uh, and the, so their picture, as we read Philemon, there's Philemon reading this letter from Paul, surrounded by his family and the church that was in his home. And in front of him is Onesimus, and he really doesn't have any idea what's happening. So... If you want to read with me, we're going to read the letter of uh, Philemon. And uh, what is a beautiful thing at the start is there's no mention, Paul, there's no mention of his apostleship. He's just a prisoner of Jesus. So uh, Philemon comes uh, after Titus and before Hebrews. It's hidden away there. Let's, Let's read it. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what's right, I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. I became his father while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and to me. And I'm sending him back to you. I'm sending my very own heart. I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed might not be out of obligation, but of your own free will. For perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a brief time so that you might get him back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He's especially so to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would me. And if he's wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your very own self. Yes, brother, may I benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I'm confident of your obedience, I'm writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, since I hope that through your prayers I will be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Eugene Peterson, in his introduction to this book, says that every movement we make in response to God has a ripple effect, touching family and neighbours, friends and community. 
And I want us to see, I believe, God would say to us this morning from this letter written a long time ago, and yet it's a letter from God to us about our lives, our situation. And I think there are three things to believe in the certainty that God is sovereign over every situation. God is working out his purposes. We may not see them, we may not understand them, but God is working out his purposes. And then secondly, to believe that God can change the most unlikely lives. And, and then thirdly, to believe that God is the God of reconciliation, of bringing us back to God to be reconciled to him and of bringing people together to be reconciled to each other. But first, let's think about belief in believing that, that God certainly is sovereign. And here was Paul in prison a number of times in the letter. He says, uh, he starts it, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And, uh, and in verse 9, I'm, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm in chains. And uh, my imprisonment, he says, is for the gospel. And even today, all, all around the world, there are people in jail. There are people suffering, not because of any crime that they've done, but because they're followers of, of Jesus. And yet, Paul doesn't allow himself to grow bitter about that. Uh, he, you know, he gives us that beautiful verse in Romans 8:28 that we know that all things, God is working all things together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. He's not saying that everything that happens is good to us, but he's saying that God somehow is working everything together for good. And, and, and as we grow, I think, in our Christian lives, we start to see something of, of how what we thought was just the end of the world, somehow God has used that. And here was Paul, you know, he could quite rightly have argued with God and said, you've given me a, a, a job to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and here I am in prison. Not only that, he says in another place, I've been shipwrecked three times. Well, three times, once would be bad enough, but I've been shipwrecked three times, I've been beaten up and, and yet all this suffering, it would, I, I believe, yes, Paul was a sinner like all of us, but all this suffering wasn't the direct result of his sin. Somehow God was allowing this and there in prison he met Onesimus. You know, sometimes I think, I remember a missionary in the Yemen years ago was telling us if you try and think of the most impossible situation you think of the Yemen which is a closed country to the gospel and has been for a long time and two men were in prison in the Yemen and they happened to hear the gospel on the radio and came to know the Lord and he just shared that to show how God's not limited by what we think is an impossible a situation and so here's Paul in prison and uh, and he he recognizes that God has put him here and uh, and God's going to work out his purposes I you know I worked with a man who was um, sometimes incredibly difficult I'm, I'm sure he won't mind me saying but he used to count the traffic lights on the way into work and, uh, and if they were too many red, it was going to be a bad day. If it was too many green, it was going to be a good day. And uh, he had a really mathematical brain, which was why I employed him, because he used to deal with all the data. But, but at the same time, he could be quite painful to deal with. But he said in the job interview, he was running away. And I didn't know why he said that, but it came clear he was running away. And people started to pray for him. He had a brother and parents who really prayed. And, uh, and God did a beautiful thing in his life. And he's, he's now involved in ministry. And I think God is going to give you difficult people 
And God's going to put you in difficult situations. But never forget that God is sovereign. And in his great love for us, he's working out these purposes. Uh, Onesimus runs away. And uh, God didn't give up. And uh, so Paul could say, I became his father while I was in chains. Paul could have argued that, what are you putting me in prison for? And yet it was while he was in prison that he was able to help Onesimus come to know Jesus. And, and, and whether you have physical children or not, God says you can be involved in spiritual children. Not to give you the glory, but that you can be involved in other people's lives to help them come to know Jesus and to grow as, as spiritual mothers and fathers, as spiritual parents. Not to hang on to people, but to help them and to release them into what God is doing. Paul says, uh, you have countless instructors in Christ in 1 Corinthians 4, 15, but you don't have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And I believe that's what he was saying about Onesimus. He wasn't his biological son, but he was his spiritual son in that somehow God, in the way he works, had brought them together and he was able to help them. So let me encourage you first of all from this letter about God is working out in his sovereign purposes what he's doing. But then believe that God can change the most unlikely lives. We've already seen he, he changed Paul, a most unlikely character. And he changed Philemon, bringing him to hear the gospel. And, uh, and, and in such a beautiful way, in verse 5, he says, I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. The hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. What a beautiful transformation in Philemon's life that he would even open up his own home for this church that had been planted uh, there in uh, Colossae. And, uh, and in one sense, as Paul writes to, uh, to Onesimus, as he, as he says um, in verse 8, I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what's right. But he says, I'm not going to use my apostolic authority, my, my way in which I could come in and command you to do this, but I'm appealing to you out of love. What a, a humility. And it, it's, it's, it's a real problem when people in church authorities can command this obedience. We ought to go back to this passage and see how, yes, it was right for Philemon to forgive Onesimus now that he's you know, come to the Lord, but Paul appeals to him out of love. And when you have a situation where it is the love of God that operates, that's what God is longing to see. When it's reconciliation, not a forced reconciliation, but out of love we come to God. Out of love we come to each other and are reconciled. That's what God, God longs to see. God had changed Onesimus. It wasn't a forced reconciliation between Philemon and Onesimus where, where um, Paul was just getting rid of Onesimus. As a matter of fact, he didn't want, to, he didn't want him to go. But God had done a beautiful work in, in the life of Onesimus. Formerly he was useful, but now he's useful both to you and to me. And, uh, and uh, Paul says to Philemon, you know, I wanted to keep him. And, uh, and you can almost see the smile on Paul's face as he says, thanks Philemon for sending me Onesimus. And Philemon says to himself, he ran away. What do you, what do you mean? You know? and, but Paul is starting to see life from the sovereignty of God. And, uh, and, and, and so he can, with a smile on his face, say to Philemon, thanks for sending Onesimus to me, even though he knew himself that Onesimus had run away. 
but, uh, but God had changed him. And, um, and there are going to be times, I guess, in your life where you have to do what is right, not what is easy. It would have been a lot easier for Paul to just have Onesimus there because he had really come to know Jesus and he had really changed and he was a great help to Paul there in prison. But Paul knew that this thing had to be put right between Philemon and Onesimus. He had to send him back. And I I just want to say sometimes in your life, in my life, there are things that are not going to be easy to do. But it's a bit like we heard last week, as Don shared, there is a good life, not, not a good life in the sense of an easy life of pleasure, but a good life where we do not what's foolish, but what's right, before God and before each other. And, and that's where it brings us to our third thing, I think. You know, we believe in the certainty of God's sovereignty. We believe that God can change the most unlikely lives, and uh, which reminded me as I was thinking about this, when I came to know Jesus, my friends said to me, you were the most unlikely person we ever thought who would come to Jesus. Oh, thanks very much. But, but God does that beyond our way of thinking but then we need to believe that God's the God of reconciliation that he not only saves us individually but he wants to bring us into a community of reconciled people of people with a common faith that know what God has done and in 2 Corinthians 5 God talks about this, everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us this ministry of reconciliation. He's committed the ministry of reconciliation to us that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God. And God wants us to see that We've been reconciled, not just to him, but we've been brought together into one body in Christ. So he writes to the Galatians and says, um, For through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. For those who are baptised into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, You are all one in Christ Jesus. And God has reconciled us so that we in turn can have this common faith in Christ. God changes us. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. And as as Jesus said, the Father has loved me and I have loved you with that same love. And now with that same love, you are to love one another and that's why Paul appeals to Philemon you could throw the book at Onesimus I mean runaway slaves were possibly you know they were usually very badly punished and even crucified and yet here is Paul uh, helping Onesimus to come back to Philemon and he and and Paul is appealing to Philemon We've got to respond with God's love. Philemon could have thought, you know, oh, what will they think of me in Colossae? You know, I'm going soft on my slaves. Or, and then what about grumbling about the money that I paid for Onesimus? And, uh, and Paul says, it's, uh, well, I think it's Philemon's uh, time to smile because Paul says, put it on my account. Put it on my credit card. You know, put it, I'll, I'll pay whatever. And Philemon thinks, yeah, yeah, a penniless Paul in prison. And, uh, but, uh, but Philemon is learning to no longer operate purely on money. He wants to operate on the love of God and live it out. You are going to receive Onesimus back, not, not just as a slave, no longer a slave, but as a dearly loved brother. 
He's especially so to me, but how much more to you? And, uh, and so God's purpose has allowed Onesimus to go a long way away, 1,500 kilometres or whatever, and to hear the good news and, and to come back. And uh, we have friends, we have workmates who are running away, and yet God is chasing after them that they might come to Jesus. And so Philemon reads the letter and, uh, and the love of God works in his heart and he welcomes Onesimus back and he said, yeah, your, uh, your bed down there is still there in the slave quarters, your bed's still there, you can welcome back and, and imagine his wife tapping him on the shoulder and said, what did the letter say? And the letter said, well, uh, Paul's wanting to come and visit if he can. Get the guest room ready. And then he says, um, and Paul's written saying, well, I trust you'll treat Onesimus the same way that you'll treat me. So his wife, uh, as often our wives do, says, um, I thought Paul said you were to treat uh, Onesimus the same way that you're going to treat me. And... uh, Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. We wouldn't put Paul down in the slave quarters uh, when he comes. And, uh, and so I, I think Paul, I think there is quite a bit of smiling on faces behind this because I can imagine Paul wondering, smiling as he says, when he comes, will I be sharing the guest room with uh, Onesimus? But um, it comes back, I think, to that uh, verse, verse 6, how... Paul is praying that we will not only know the fellowship that it is part of our lives as believers, but that that fellowship will become real. We'll participate in this true fellowship of love for God and love for each other. That we were alienated, we were hostile, and God has not only brought us back to him, but he's brought us into a family. I, I heard a message by a preacher called Haddon Robinson who illustrated it by saying um, many years ago he was engaged and he went to visit his, wife, his future wife's parents. They went to visit them over the other side of the United States and, uh, and so they, they arrived at the place and knocked on the door and um, his fiancée's um, parents welcomed him in and they sat down and had a beautiful meal and they said to him, uh, listen, the, the fridge is full of food, help yourself any time. And then they showed him the room where he was going to stay while they were there, a beautiful room. And then they said, oh yeah, and the car's in the driveway, just help yourself to, uh, you know, we don't use the car that much, just help yourself. And he said, you know, if I had knocked on the door as a stranger, well, you know, they're a lovely couple and they probably would have given me a sandwich on the, uh, on the front veranda if I was, uh, you know, hungry. But I entered in and I became part of the family. And, and, I was, and that was simply because I was engaged to their daughter. And God says with us that to become a believer, it's not just that someone's gone down to the registry office, the office and paid our fine for our speeding fine. They've actually invited us into the family. And that's what God has done. He's reconciled us to himself We're accepted in the beloved. We're accepted in God's love, not just that our sins have been forgiven, amazing as that is, but what's even more amazing is we're invited into the family. And that's why I think God, one of the reasons God gave us this book of Philemon, to see he was a useless slave, but out of love he's invited in and reconciled and been brought in to the very family that he ran away from. He chose us. So the book of Philemon gives us this beautiful picture of reconciliation. 
between us and God, but also between each other. As I've said, Paul was not imposing a false reconciliation, but there was a genuine repentance in Onesimus' life, so much so that he was willing to even go and face the music. And there was an appeal of love to Philemon. And that's true reconciliation. When both sides have come to recognise their deep needs and have responded with the love of God. God's put you in neighbourhoods, put all of us in workplaces where it's, it's not easy to do what's right. But he enables us by his Holy Spirit, the spirit of love and of community and of care. He, he starts to change us and to change the world begins with that change in heart. So I want to say to you this morning, believe in the certainty that God is sovereign, working out his purposes, that believe that God can change the most unlikely lives and believe that God is the God of reconciliation, that he can bring together what was so far apart.